everybody, George Soto here, tuning in from Miami Beach, Florida. Today I am joining the CEO of Excel Events, Jonathan Kazarian, who dives into his origin story and gives us some tips and advice around building brands in B2B and of course best practices for event marketers. It is an absolutely beautiful day here in Miami, so definitely check it out. How did you get into tech startups? Yeah, it uh, wasn't intentional. I'll say that. I, throughout college, was very adamant that I wanted to go into finance, and that's what I did when I graduated. And then once I got into this asset management hedge fund in Boston, I had the opportunity to run a couple of events there. So I did that, and frankly, it was just like way more fun than finance. So that happened, and then my cousin at the age of 17, um, she got diagnosed with cancer and I wanted to do something for her. So I ended up renting out the aquarium in Boston to host a fundraiser. And going into that event, I couldn't find any decent tech to help me run it. So I ended up building out my own solution. We got really good feedback from the attendees, from the organization we put the event on for. And that was really my catalyst. It was just, I needed a solution for myself. I realized how hard events are and that tech needed to be there to make life easier and that's where it all began. So who we're working with today is pretty different than who it was when we began. When we launched the platform, it was really focused on fundraising for you know, auctions, raffles, text to give campaigns, but very quickly we moved into the ticketing space and then from there into registration. Today we focus on corporate and associations. So about 60% of our business is corporate, around 30% associations, and the rest is kind of a mix of, of different types of organizations. Uh, in terms of who's using it, it's anybody who's hosting a large-scale conference, you know, maybe a 10,000 person conference, down to organizations that are doing 1,200 events per year. The advice I would have given myself um, there's one thing I got right, which is picking an industry that I love. There's just something about events, the sense of urgency that comes with it, the bringing people together that I find so much fun. And it's one of those things where like, there's these concrete endings. It's kind of like sports where you're, you have a game or a season that you're playing for, unlike some other industries where it just kind of goes on forever. But the other aspect is we went really hard on talking to customers. That was everything. And it wasn't just talking to them to help ourselves, but really to help them. From day one, customer support was, you know, it was what we were all about. And it was in part because, you know, I talked about the event where we had to build our own solution, but we also used another solution in addition to what we built, and we were burned by that tool. We couldn't get a hold of anybody on the day of the event when shit kind of hit the fan, and we needed help. And from there, we decided that as we build this company, we're gonna be available 24 seven, 365 to answer any questions that come up. And in turn, customers, they recognize that. And when they have ideas, they have questions, they have problems, instead of just giving up on us, they talk to us, they tell us. So the number one thing I would say is really to put the time into talking to your customers. Awesome. What was unexpectedly easy about being in tech? co-founder or CEO? Unexpectedly easy. In today's world, building the product, I think is, it's, a, it's really scary for people to get started, but it shouldn't be. It's easy enough to start building as long as you start. The opposite is what's really hard and that's building a brand, building reputation, building trust, it takes a long time and a lot of work. Marketing in general, it's, uh, it's always a moving target and you never really feel like you got it right. You never really do have it right because there's always tomorrow, there's always more that you can do. And you can never shut off. Founder-led is obviously a very strong channel. It's, you know, if you're gonna have the conviction to go out there and build a company, then have the, have the same conviction to share the story with the world. Tell everyone why you're doing it. What is it that you're learning along the way? And be out there and make noise. It's, you, you can't do it uh, in isolation. You have to be showing face. And that's showing face on social, it's showing face at events. It's having that presence and that thought leadership to set 
your company apart as somebody who's not just going through the motions, but who actually cares, who's actually trying to drive progress forward and who wants to learn from customers. The advice I would give event marketers there's a couple of elements, but the first and foremost, the biggest issue that we see, it's people overcomplicating registration forms, right? Optimize for conversion. If we want to take a lesson from consumer brands, it's conversion rate optimization. They're always 10 years ahead of B2B, and that's something that they've nailed, especially DTC companies over the past decade. So optimize the experience to get people in the door, right? Get them to the checkout phase, first and foremost. Now, backing up a step, let's talk about the event website. So event marketers often build their event website focused on the person that's been there last year. There's an assumption on a lot of event websites that people already know what the event's about, what it's gonna cover. That's not true, right? The person who was there last year, the only thing that they care about on the website, location, the date, and how much the ticket costs. They're gonna convert based on last year's experience. The person you should be optimizing for is the one who heard about it, maybe from that other person, but you need to convince them why they need to be there. Why do they want to give up their time, their money, get away from their family to attend your event? Why you know, They can make that bet once, twice a year maybe to go and travel to an event. Why is yours the one that's worth it? And you have to have that story in mind. Um, another aspect of you know, what, I would, what I would tell an event marketer in terms of optimizing the experience, when it comes to the event tech side of things, go through the entire experience from start to finish. Everything from the first impression on that website, through checking out for the ticket, through the check-in experience and badge printing, through accessing the mobile app if you have one, go through every one of those touch points and look for how that could be better and work with your event tech provider to make sure that it is getting better because it's setting the tone for your attendees, right? That registration process is the very first time they interact with you. And if that registration process feels like MySpace or something from 15 years ago, what does that say about your event? When we see those really lengthy registration forms, I often ask, like, how did you decide on these questions? The answer was a committee. You get somebody from marketing ops, somebody from the sales team, somebody from the marketing team, the CMO, all get in the room together and say, hey, this is the information we need to justify this event. Nobody's ever gonna use 75% of that, but they all feel like they need to chime in and all of a sudden you have this bloated process killing conversion rate. For exhibitors, I mean, it's certainly about putting a library of content together to follow up with attendees. It's really going into that experience, exhibiting at an event prepared, making sure this is a, a, a you know, requirement for an event marketer, but event marketers are quarterbacking that experience. It's their responsibility to pull the collateral together, to make sure the follow-up campaigns are together, to coach the sales team on site around what materials they have available and the process for following up. And then the biggest thing that I see them drop the ball on is how the reps actually represent and interact when they're in the booth. You see reps that are floating around the rest of the floor, they're on their phone in the booth, that should be table stakes. But then if you go and speak to those people and then challenge anyone to do this the next time they go to go to an event, try chatting with three reps from the same company and see if, ask them what the company does, see if you hear the same thing. Right off the bat, like set the tone, set the narrative. This is how we're going to represent ourselves when somebody walks up to us and asks, what is it that you do? Or I heard about you, I saw your ad, tell me more about what you do. It's never consistent. I, I don't think the misalignment between sales and marketing is intentional. I think it's I think it's laziness that's triggering it. It's a lot of work to wrangle a sales team and try to teach them this is the narrative that we're gonna put out there, right? They always feel like, hey, I make 100 dials a day. I say the same thing. I know what to say better than you, marketing person. So you're trying to convince this person or 10 of those people who are coming at you together that they need to change something they're doing. That's, that's hard enough. And then there's just the aspect of even starting that process, right? You have to bring these people together. It's busy calendars. And there's just not, there's not as much intention behind doing that because when an event marketer is really tasked with putting this production together, whether it's an owned event that they're hosting or it's exhibiting at another event, at a trade show, they're really measured on execution more than ROI, more than what happened from the people that we met with at that event 
and tracking them throughout the funnel. So I think it's in part changing the way that we're measuring success for event marketers. And then you also have other stakeholders. You know, if you're bringing 10 people to an event, you might have five salespeople, three marketers, a uh, sales engineer, a product person. So you've got all these other personas in there as well that you know, five different personas that are getting different narratives told to them on how to communicate. Who's responsible for quarterbacking that and bringing that all together? It should be the event marketer. But in a lot of organizations, maybe the title of that event marketer is lower than some of these other stakeholders. So it can sometimes be a big ask or a more senior person isn't as interested in listening. We need to change that because in order to make events as successful as they possibly can be, we have to all be intentional about about the way that we're communicating and positioning ourselves. Historically, event marketers have been measured first and foremost in the number of attendees at an event. Some people claim that that's just a, sort of a facade, a you know, irrelevant metric, but I think it actually is a very valid metric as long as those are qualified people, but a lead is not pipeline. And we need to be measuring events on pipeline, at least in the corporate space. When it comes to measuring events on, on pipeline, far too often people are using a 30 or 60 day, 60 day window. And if you're selling enterprise tech, you mentioned 50K deals, that's not a two week sales cycle, right? Somebody's in a year long contract already. They're not necessarily in market around the time when they might have interacted with you at the event. So it's measuring pipeline over at least a 365 day window. And that should be dependent on deal size and sales cycle as well. There's a variety of personas when it comes to salespeople, right? Some are really good at follow-up, some are really good closers. Event marketers should be measured on pipeline, not just close one. So when it comes to the people that you're bringing to your events, and especially if you're hosting you know, five or more events per year, look at the follow-up rates for the reps that you're bringing and intentionally invite the reps who are the best at follow-up, who have the highest pipeline conversion rate from the interactions they have. Those are the people that really care, that want to be there, that are basically begging for the leads they're going to be able to generate on site. It's not the person who's going to be scrolling their phone when they're there or waiting a week to follow up with the leads, right? The person who's only really good at getting things over the finish line is not the person that you need at that event. We had a three-hour strategy meeting this morning and one of the things that we noticed was within our industry, there's so much focus on the admin experience when using event tech, right? What are the processes that it makes more efficient? But we're completely neglecting that attendee experience. And at the end of the day, the attendee experience is the only thing that matters. Because if we don't get attendees returning to our events, we don't get attendees thinking higher of our brand because of our events, then we're not gonna be able to generate pipeline. We're not moving anything further forward. So we're working right now to rejigger some of our ad campaigns to focus more on the attendee experience improvements that our platform brings because we've been getting great feedback from customers on these like anecdotal sound bites that they're hearing from attendees on site. And it's actually a great lead gen opportunity for us. So as in those people could come and host events with us, but um, it was top of mind because we were talking about it this morning. I post to LinkedIn at least four days a week. Uh, get up early, spend an hour or so writing each post, really thinking about the conversations I had the prior day, the prior week. Uh, we're hosting a dinner series in different cities. We'll bring 25 to 35 event marketers together, event managers and event marketers. And I take the learnings and I distill that down and I share that out. What we've gotten in return from that investment is um, about a 3x in word of mouth as our self-reported attribution channel for new leads. But we're also building an intangible element of trust within the industry by being a thought leader there. And it helps shape the way that customers come to us, the way they think of us, the way that we think about our product and our roadmap. So, you know, if I were to, if I were to make a suggestion to any other founder, well, for one, if you're a competitor, don't do this, but a suggestion to any other founder as it pertains to LinkedIn is put the investment in because in addition to all the other benefits that you're gonna get that I mentioned a moment ago, the other thing that's gonna happen is when you sit down and you write every day, you reflect on the industry, your business, and you learn from yourself. 
it's almost like it doesn't matter that it's LinkedIn, but the LinkedIn aspect becomes the forcing function to do it.